new semester, and there's nobody more fitting to start off our semester than Professor Robert Wistra. Professor Wistra, as many of you know, is the uh, head of the Vidal Sassoon Center for the Study of Antisemitism at Hebrew University. Um, he's also the Nürnberger Chair of Modern European and Jewish History at Hebrew University. I won't go into details, but for decades has been a leading scholar on issues of antisemitism, uh, antisemitism within the European context on the left and, and the like. He's written numerous books, many, many articles. He's been a consultant and filmmaker. He's been a consultant for the BBC and international news agencies. He's helped to produce important films, um, like <laughs> hatred and the like. Um, so I won't go into all the details to waste precious time. And as you can see here, uh, it's a very important contribution to the whole um, discourse and discussions about anti-Semitism within the historical context, but also Professor Wistrup is also focusing on contemporary issues and shedding light on an area that's not only understudied, but I think I would argue, at least from my perspective, really not understood by the academy, by the media, and certainly by policymakers, and Professor Wistrup's contribution in a lethal obsession, I think is very important and I would urge you to purchase the books. They'll be on sale after the seminar is complete. They're $40 and there'll be a representative from uh, the bookstore who will be here to take your, your book. So, Professor Rich, question. First of all, I would like to thank Charles Small for inviting me here second time I've been here in the recent uh, class, and to congratulate him on having uh, initiated and gotten this project, interdisciplinary project on anti-Semitism uh, going at Yale University, and to see such a uh, full uh, audience here, I think, is, among other things, also a tribute to the success of, the, of this enterprise which is more important today uh, than it ever was. I have approximately 40 minutes to provide a very broad outline of what are some of the key themes uh, in this study, and it is a very comprehensive, systematic um, piece of research over a thousand pages on all aspects of anti-Semitism. Not so much in the conventional historical or historiographical mold of going from antiquity step by step through the different periods and ages, but rather it's an inquiry that began and begins in the present, which was set off by the events at the beginning of this last decade, 2000-2001, that's when I began in earnest to collect the research material. Understanding even then that this was likely to be the most uh, significant resurgence of anti-Semitism since World War II, as indeed it's proven to be. So approximately 80% of this book is focused on the last 20 years, but as I discovered in the course of writing it, there are very few themes in it which don't have deep roots, often in antiquity, sometimes in the Middle Ages, early modern period, but they cannot be understood. The things which are often referred to rather casually as the new anti-Semitism, in 90% of cases is not new at all. At best, we can say it's a blend of old and new. <coughs> And therefore, it is absolutely essential to be familiar with and to know and understand the history of that person. I want, before I begin, uh, to focus on the two main issues that I wish to discuss uh, with you today. Namely, <coughs> contemporary European anti-Semitism and contemporary Muslim anti-Semitism, I want to touch on at least three issues that I think have produced widespread misunderstanding 
about what is the nature of anti-Semitism, <coughs> if so facto. The first of the common misapprehensions is, in my view, the idea that anti-Semitism can best be understood as a prejudice. I have never really been very convinced by this approach. First of all, I think that this is a far too universal and sweeping category that really doesn't begin to touch on the specific and particular characteristics of anti-Semitism. Yes, of course, it is one among many different forms of prejudice. And indeed, prejudice is not really widespread, it is universal. I have yet to meet a single human being who was not prejudiced, and I include myself. We all prejudge, which is the literal meaning of prejudice. And we have to prejudge things. Of course, we need to guard against generalization. And generalizations are made about Jews as they are made about many different ethnic groups, religious groups, nationalities, and so on. We all know that. But there is a huge gulf between everyday common garden varieties of prejudice and what I, not by accident, entitled my book, A Leaf of Obsession. Lethal and obsessional, that's not prejudice. That's already in a different category. So if at one, <clears throat> at one extreme of the spectrum, the most benign aspect of anti-Jewish sentiment might be the, uh, the casual remark about Jews that we would call prejudiced, at the other spectrum, there is mass murder. And in between, there are many gradations. So, to content oneself merely with the study of anti-Semitism as prejudice would be to step, perhaps, on the first rung of a ladder. But if you stop there, you haven't gone very far. And in fact, in my view, you've contributed very little to the understanding of the more dangerous, the more virulent, let alone violent forms of anti-Semitism. The second point, which we hear all the time, I heard it at Indiana University, where they are about to launch uh, a center for the study of anti-Semitism. <coughs> heard it from the dean of the faculty, as I've heard it thousands of times from others who basically said the reason we have to study anti-Semitism is because it is a form of racism. And, uh, and it will help us to illuminate the wider phenomenon of racism. I disagree. I think there are forms of anti-Semitism which are indeed racist. And racism was one factor, although in my view overrated, racism was one factor that led to the <coughs> escalation of anti-Semitism in Germany and to the Holocaust. But it was not necessarily the driving force of that anti-Semitism. <coughs> and there are a number of ob obvious points to be made. I won't go into this at length. The first is that anti-Semitism has a far longer history than modern racism. Modern racist theories and uh, the basis on which they were constructed probably emerges at least 1,500 years after. Anti-Semitism is thoroughly embedded in uh, European society and in some other parts of the world. And that anti-Semitism owed absolutely nothing, zero, zero, to racist thinking. So it's very important to understand that, because people don't. And then they start 
a, a reductivist uh, <coughs> way of thinking which reduces anti-Semitism to some kind of subcategory of racist prejudice. And they don't even begin, in my view, to grasp the special characteristics of what I called back in 1990, and I actually coined the term 20 years ago, the longest hatred. I do believe that anti-Semitism is the longest hatred. Another point, which I think could provide uh, fuel for discussion later, is that anti-Semitism, apart from having a long history and therefore many continuities, which I seek to bring out uh, in my book, also <coughs> changes and even mutates, uh, which is somewhat puzzling. How can a phenomenon be so persistent over time, uh, so seemingly ubiquitous, and demonstrate so many continuities, and yet at the same time be capable of constant transformation? <coughs> Often assuming an almost protean quality, able to adapt anti-Semites in every generation, wherever they're coming from, whether they're coming from the right or the left, whether they're religiously or secularly minded, whether they're Christian or Muslim or atheist, whatever, anti-Semites seem to have learned how to adapt themselves to the zeitgeist, to use the costume of the time and uh, to update what are often very repetitive <coughs> assumptions. So the justice Jews themselves uh, could be said to be highly adaptable people and very protean, which is part of the anti-Semitic description, but is also true in its own right. Uh, so anti-Semites seem to accompany the Jews. Sometimes I think of it metaphorically as a shadow that is accompanying the Jewish people uh, in its long uh, march through the exile of the Galut but which has persisted and continued even after the foundation of the State of Israel, and indeed has asserted itself with renewed vigor in recent decades. One last general point, which is the contradictory nature of so many anti-Semitic arguments. It never fails to um, strike me the logical non sequiturs, the ways in which anti-Semitism describes the Jews simultaneously with characteristics that in all other circumstances would be considered mutually contradictory. For example, Jews are particulars. They are tribal people. They are, uh, they are parochial. They only care about themselves. They are clannish. That is one. <coughs> very well-known uh, stereotypical <coughs> representation of Jews with a long history. And at the same time, you find the representation of the Jew or the Jewish people as being highly cosmopolitan, as being international, uh, a transnational people <coughs> with no roots and uh, <coughs> nomadic and so on and so forth. And these two notions often coexist. Sometimes the same person can even maintain it without being aware of the contradiction. Even in Nazi anti-Semitism you have the notion that the Jews are a distinct race, that they are the true initiators and the teachers of the world in the matter of purity of race, and some anti-Semites actually modeled themselves on what they presumed to be the Jewish concern for blood purity, and at the same time, the denunciation of the international Jew. This was a very dominant uh, perception in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. It was even the title of Henry Ford's uh, 
version of the protocols of Zion, the international Jew. Jews responsible for secularism and at the same time for religious fanaticism. <coughs> Some of the great uh, enlightenment figures in Europe, as opposed to the United States, as should be said, uh, particularly Voltaire, was very fond of claiming that it was this, um, this small, insignificant, barbarous, superstitious people called the Jews who dared to presume that they were a chosen people, who had in fact introduced a plague of monotheism into the world. And this, after 1,500 years or more, where the cry of the Jews as the Christ killers had resounded through Europe and, and continued to do right down into the 20th century. So the Jews are the Christ killers on the one hand, and on the, on the other hand, they are the inventors of monotheism, and that is their original sin. That particular <coughs> perception in the 19th and 20th centuries you find among atheistic anti-Sigma. Let nobody think that the problem resides in the Jewish religion. But for atheists it does, because it is for the atheistic anti-Sigma, because for them, and they are all the disciples or the children of Voltaire, Judaism is the source of Christian fanaticism. It is the original biblical source for intolerance, for cruelty, for inhumanity, and there are echoes of that today as well. In the allegations that are growing, this is definitely resurgent today, that Judaism itself, inherently, in its <coughs> essence, is racist. It is the source of racism. That is a deeply anti-Semitic notion, but it is widespread and a complete misunderstanding of Judaism. And of course, that famous contradiction that we are all aware of, that the Jews were the inventors of capitalism, and at the same time, they were the architects, the organizers, and the driving force of communism. And this has been astonishingly persistent. It did not begin with the Nazi movement, although they, um, they exploited this idea to great effect. It began already in the mid-19th century, and to the best of my knowledge, its first significant source was none other than a famous Russian revolutionary and the father of modern anarchism, Mikhail Bakunin. Because in 1869, he claimed that there was indeed a world Jewish conspiracy long before the protocols of the elders of Zion. And that world Jewish conspiracy was <coughs> symbolized by two names. Karl Marx, with whom he was in a state of, of at that time, of of ideological enmity in the extreme, and Rothschild. Marx and Rothschild were the two, oh, two Bakunin wrote this in an important work, which um, was a source book for many revolutionists in Russia. Today, or in the post-war period, the idea that the Jews were behind capitalism and communism, particularly made its mark in the Islamic world. And I'll come, at, I'll come to that later. But it has never disappeared. And needless to say, on the far right, among neo-Nazis, this is, this is standard, nothing has changed. But also, you can find echoes sometimes on the left. <coughs> Now let me come to Europe. I don't have the time, although I'm sure we can go into it uh, 
the questions. To trace what I trace in great detail here, individual countries in Western Europe and Eastern Europe today, and the way in particular that the interaction between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism in the last 30 years, and with a special virulence in the last decade, how this has worked itself out in the public discourse, in the media, and among intellectuals, in the academy. The academy is one of the most serious uh, sources, if I can put it this way, of infection of anti-Semitism <coughs> in the contemporary world. And nobody should be surprised. You look at the history of modern anti-Semitism, I say this uh, without tongue-in-cheek, the contribution of intellectuals has been uh, remarkable. And there is absolutely no grounds for the assumption that because people, this is an assumption I've often encountered in America, but also elsewhere, the assumption that because people are more educated, uh, because they are supposedly have been taught to think critically, that they're going to be immune or immunized against uh, anti-Semitic sentiment. It's impossible to avoid the role that intellectuals, and by no means only on the right, that was more fashionable on the right in the 1920s to the 1950s, but uh, one of the shifts of the post-war era has been of anti-Semitism, uh, risking a broad generalization here, uh, from the right more towards the left. Justice has moved more from the Christian to the Muslim world in terms of its center of gravity without ever disappearing where it originated, but becoming more muted, more dormant, but nonetheless complicit. Rather than discuss individual countries, particularly Britain, France, uh, Germany, Spain, Scandinavia, they're, they're all examples which are multiplied many times over in my book, which are mind-boggling, literally. So you start putting them together and connecting the dots. I would like to say something about the left. Because uh, the time has come, uh, in fact it's long overdue, to get to grips with why the left, in a moment I'll qualify that, that's a very broad category as I know, um, why the left has allowed itself to become infected by the malady of anti-Semitism, even while frequently uh, vehemently denying the fact. That too has a long history. I have a chapter on the 19th century socialists, anarchists, uh, different varieties of, of left-wing thought which were thoroughly permeated uh, from uh, Karl Marx and the French socialists in the 1830s and 40s onwards with uh, this association of Jews with capitalism. Jews as an exploitative, parasitic group uh, questioning the right of Jews to maintain a separate identity of any kind as being anything more than a reactionary relic of the Middle Ages in the best of cases. And that, of course, was an inheritance that was then taken on board by the communist movement and became anchored in communist dogma. There is a problem with the left which is very obvious when you seek to compare it with right-wing anti-Soviet. That the left claims to observe and to be dedicated to universalist principles. That the left sees itself as being on the side of emancipation, universal human emancipation, opposition to all forms of racism, discrimination, etc., etc. The brotherhood of man. But in practice, the record at best is mixed and often very dark. Let's just take, for the purpose of the post-war era, 
the contribution, quote unquote, of Stalinism. This is an important section in my book because I think it's widely overlooked. That in many respects, the godfather of post war anti Zionist anti Semitism, anti Zionist definitely in quotation marks, <coughs> was Joseph Stalin, Comrade Stalin, father of the peoples, uh, the great light of humanity, and uh, fondly known in this country during the wartime alliance as Uncle Joe. Anybody remember that? <laughs> we have a witness. I remember living with us. <laughs> known as a Tolstoy killer. Uh, I never heard that one. <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> so I was born just after the war in the Soviet Union. So I know what I speak. <laughs> and, and I also read Russian. <coughs> and I can tell you that Stalin, and to this day, I feel the definitive work has not been written and needs to be written about the Jews of Stalin. Not Stalin and the Jews. On that, there is quite a significant literature which clearly shows that Stalin was an anti-Semite from an early age, that he quite cunningly and successfully disguised the fact for many years, that it exploded with full force and say even pathologically after 1945, and notwithstanding the fact one of the astounding paradoxes of history which never fails to offer up surprises that Stalin was not just the godfather of post-war anti-Semitism on the left and of the anti-Zionist variety but he was also the godfather of the Jewish state because without his agreement whether it was active or passive it's hard to be certain that uh, Czechoslovakia which was already in, more or less in the Soviet bloc, would provide Israel with desperately needed armaments to continue its war of independence. Who knows what the outcome of the 1948 war, which established Israel, would have been. And this was at a time when the United States put an embargo on arms to Israel. And apart from President Truman, all the elite of the American administration was opposed to the establishment of Israel. A time when the British Empire did everything in its power to abort the foundation of Israel. And the Soviet Union was there and supported something conveniently forgotten by the left of our time. They had nothing to say about that. And communists around the world supported the state of Israel because Comrade Stalin and the Soviet leadership <coughs> were in favor. And they made speeches at the United Nations, Zionist speeches, even though they were doctrinally anti-Zionist. So that needs to be remembered. Just before Stalin died in March 1953, fortunately indeed, he died at that time, uh, he was unable to implement the plan that he had developed for the mass deportation of Soviet Jewry, more than three million strong, to Siberia and Kazakhstan. If you ask where I was born, that's where I was born. But fortunately, I left before this plan. Not in the Ukraine. So, um, there was a plan, and it was quite elaborate. But Stalin it died, as you know, in circumstances that have never been fully uh, clarified but he may well have been expedited to another world by some of his closest colleagues who knew that they were earmarked as being victims of the next purge. There was also another reason which is rarely mentioned, uh, although the case is very well known, namely the doctor's plot, the so-called doctor's plot of 1952, when under Stalin's stage management, the top physicians of the Kremlin, who took care of Stalin himself and the Soviet leadership, the majority of whom were Jewish doctors, because they only trusted Jewish doctors, you see, for really good medical care. <laughs> uh, 
they were imprisoned, interrogated, tortured, and accused of being spies and working for the um, British and American intelligence agencies and the Zionists. <coughs> and then when Stalin had his attack, his stroke, <coughs> none of those Jewish doctors were available to come in his hour of need. They might have saved his life. Uh -huh. I note that in passing because it's never mentioned. Uh, the other thing that's uh, worth noting, if you believe in divine providence, <laughs> is that Stalin died on Purim. <laughs> so it was really a Purim festival. Um, a Purim spiel. The left, and this is the serious point I'm going to make, the left by which I mean right now, the more radical left, the left wing of the social democratic parties in Europe, the communists, uh, the Trotskyists, among the most militant, uh, vociferous, and uh, often hateful opponents of the existence of Israel. They have a long tradition of doing that. And the Jewish Trotskyists have been particularly prominent in that activity, <coughs> as they are in a great deal of the left-wing indictments of Israel, whether it's in this country or around the world, and in Israel itself. So that, too, has to be taken into account. Uh, the Jewish people has never, has never wanted for enemies, even within its own ranks. You know, it's a gift. <laughs> Perhaps that too is a divine providence. I don't know. Um, however, when I study the discourse of the anti-Zionist left, let's call it that for the moment, the anti-Zionist left around the world today and provide a lot of chapter and verse, on this subject. What do I find? It's almost as if they were copying without knowing it, plagiarizing, all the wooden language of the totalitarian Soviet system in the 60s, 70s, <coughs> and early 80s. It's the same mantras, the same empty uh, propagandist rhetoric. Zionism, equals fascism, equals racism, <coughs> equals apartheid, equals <coughs> Nazism, equals imperialism, equals colonialism. It's the darkest form of reaction that exists. It's the enemy of progress. It's the enemy of peace and humanity. <coughs> we could go on and on and on reciting the different labels that have been attached, all of them derogatory, all of them um, indicating that Zionism is not merely illegitimate, and the state of Israel, based on its foundations, is totally illegitimate, but that it is an offense, a stain, on uh, progressive humanity. Every word of this was pumped into the system, so to speak, by a powerful state, a superpower in its day, for decades in the Soviet Union, to serve partly foreign policy and partly domestic policy objectives. The Soviet Union came and went. But that legacy, irrespective of whether the contemporary left is aware of it or not, probably not even aware of it, because it doesn't even know it's Marx and Engels anymore. It's the same language. And it's totally disconnected from reality. I want the remaining few minutes to say something about what is unquestionably, and uh, therefore I devoted five chapters to the subject, the last five chapters, uh, the most dynamic, the most uh, disturbing, the most dangerous, the most, uh, to put it bluntly, genocidal form of anti-Semitism today. When I say genocidal, I mean potentially genocidal. Fortunately, there is one vital difference between 1939, 1940, and 2009-2010. There are many similarities, far more than people want to address, but there is one fundamental, crucial difference. And that is that the Jewish people are not powerless. 
that they have a modicum of power, that there is a state of Israel, that it has a deterrent force. That makes a huge difference. One of the continuing facts about anti-Semitism, which we must never ignore, is that the Jews were persecuted for so many centuries because they had no defense. There were all kinds of religious, secular, socio-economic, and other reasons. And they are fairly well known. But to be a minority, and a minority of some importance, which played, uh, which fulfilled some important uh, economic and other roles, and which is fundamentally connected to the Christian narrative, because the position of the Jews in the Christian world is unlike that of any other group. Because the whole basis of Christianity would crumble and fall if there were no Judaism. That's one of the terrible ironies of that long history of persecution. Because Christianity sought in establishing its identity and in creating the basis of its own power and its expansion throughout the world to negate Judaism and to claim that the raison d'etre of the Jews as a people had ceased with the emergence of Christ. At the same time, they needed the Jewish people to survive as a witness to the Christian truth. This was the Augustinian doctrine. Therefore, that's one of the reasons why, even in the worst periods of Christian demonolo demonology of the Jews in the Middle Ages, there was no final solution quote, unquote. The Jews had to be permitted to live, albeit in humiliating and degrading circumstances, to bear witness to the truth, and eventually to come round to that truth, to see the light. See the light meaning to convert to Christianity. And only then would the final redemption come. Now in Islam, the theology is somewhat different. There is no story of the crucifixion, nothing parallel to the Christ killers. <coughs> but Muhammad waged a war against the Jews in the Arabian Peninsula. And he <coughs> killed the males of one tribe and enslaved the women and children and expelled the other tribe. That war of Muhammad, which he instigated against the Jews in 7th century Arabia, is a very important theme of contemporary Islamic fundamentalism constantly go back to this inspiring example. If it was done then, it can be done again. It can be repeated. Islam, therefore, has at its core elements in its narrative in the Quran and also in the sayings attributed to Muhammad, which are anti jewish it's true you can also find other passages in the Quran which are less hostile. Although I didn't yet come across any that are friendly. But that could also be said about the New Testament as well. The question is often raised, is it not true that Jews living in Islamic lands were treated better? Their conditions were more favorable? than in Christendom. Is it not true that Islamic civilization was more tolerant, more pluralistic, and that up until the 20th century, there, Islam and Muslims in general did not have a major problem with Jews? I would say on balance, that is a very rosy, idyllic picture. It has some elements of truth depending which place, at what time, we're speaking about. There was a moment, an important moment of conviviencia in Spain, of collaboration, cooperation, Jews reached <coughs> high positions, uh, they, they wrote in Arabic, there was a kind of symbiosis for a while in Spain, which turned south, not just on the Christian side, although it was far worse there because 
the Catholicization of Spain in the 15th century uh, led to the expulsion of Jews, and before that to the mass conversion of Jews, and the Inquisition as a result of that, and also the expulsion of the Muslims, which came a little bit later. The Ottoman Empire was something of an exception. <coughs> the Ottoman Empire was probably the best case study where you could make an argument for uh, Islamic civilization being relatively more tolerant. And certainly they gave shelter to Jews fleeing from Spain. But when you look at the wider picture, you see that Jews were extremely vulnerable, that they, <coughs> their status was completely subordinate. Uh, Christians, too, had a subordinate status in Islamic land. They were permitted some religious autonomy. Uh, they were not subjected to the same level of demonization as existed in Christian Europe. But relations were uneasy. Periodically, there were pogroms. There's a lot of denial about that. But I think that the record is pretty unequivocal. Just they didn't happen on the same scale as in Christendom. When we come to the 19th, and especially the 20th century on that, I want to focus now. The main argument that is introduced by the apologists, whether of the Palestinian cause or of Islam as a whole, or the anti-Zionists, is to say Zionism was the cause of all problems. No Zionism, no crisis, in Muslim-Jewish relations. No Zionism, no Israel, no Arab anti-Semitism, no Muslim anti-Semitism. How many times have you not heard that? <coughs> I would like just very briefly to make a number of points. A great length I go into this question. In a First of all, I think that more important than the issue of Palestine, even though I don't dismiss it, Palestine was a, a critical trigger in the 20th century for uh, arousing hatreds and demagogic passions uh, against the Jews and Zionism and subsequently Israel. I think the failed Muslim encounter with modernity in the long run is more significant. Because in most of the Arab world in particular, that is the most obvious, the most striking uh, conclusion you can draw from the last hundred years. And it's a massive failure. Uh, I won't go into, but you can easily refer to it, the reports uh, composed actually by Arab intellectuals on behalf of UNESCO about human development <coughs> in the Arab world. And the, the deficit in education, in, in <coughs> attitudes to women, in uh, uh, the lack of translations, the lack of cultural um, interchange, of course the lack of freedom, fundamental. The stagnation of the Arab world and large chunks of the Muslim world, a few exceptions here and there, such as Turkey, which was the one example of a relatively secularized uh, uh, Muslim republic after 1920, uh, which is also now beginning to go in a <coughs> different direction. So accompanied by anti-Semitism, it should be said. So, um, this failed encounter with modernity produced many of the symptoms that made the Arab world receptive to European-style anti-Semitism, which itself was partly a response to a failed encounter with modernity. For instance, the opposition to, uh, or the belief that the Jews were the inspirers of liberalism, of socialism, of communism, of secularism. That's a, a familiar European idea. <coughs> Many Catholics, Protestants, and others uh, held that belief. In the Muslim world, 
it has been extremely effective. In the 1930s and 40s, this is a key link to today. You all have heard, of course, of uh, the leader of the Palestinian Arab national movement, Haj Amin Mohammed al Husseini. For 40 years, he was the dominant figure of Palestinian nationalism from 1920 to the 1960s. Haj Amin, from the early 1930s, <coughs> far from being a Palestinian nationalist, and a radical fundamentalist, <coughs> very close to the, uh, to the world view of the founder of Islamic fundamentalism, the Egyptian, <coughs> Hassan Abana. Haj Amin uh, was also an anti-Semite of the first order. Don't let anybody tell you this was anti-Zionism. Anti-Zionism was one element of position, in other words, the creation of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Of course that was an element in Hajjami's political activity. It was fundamental to it. But the anti-Semitism of Hajjami, and he was one of a number of leading figures of Arab nationalism of that time, and of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Their doctrines, their teachings, their propaganda is riddled <coughs> with anti-Semitism of the worst kind. And hence, it's no accident that in his years in Berlin, between 1941 and 1945, he's not merely an ally and a collaborator of Adolf Hitler. His best friends in Berlin are Heinrich Himmler and Adolf Eichmann. And Haj Amin was very interested in the death camps and making sure that they were working efficiently, because he knew about the final solution, and he made sure that not one single Jewish man, woman, or child would be allowed to leave the European continent while the final solution was being implemented because there were governments in the Balkans, governments of Romania, of Hungary, of Bulgaria, that were willing, for their own reasons, usually in exchange for bribes, to send a certain number of Jewish children to Palestine. And when Haj Amin was informed about it, all this is documented, it's even been translated into English, it's easily accessible. These are now known facts. And he wasn't a loner. It wasn't an exceptional case. And he was the authentic representative of Palestinian nationalism. And his type of anti-Semitism is Nazi anti-Semitism in an Islamic mold. But most of the arguments are instantly familiar to anyone who knows the history of European anti-Semitism. And they are, they are mixed with some Islamic uh, uh, and Quranic uh, uh, slogans and reference to Muhammad's war against the Jews and so on. And since then, you look at all the movements that we, we read about every day in our newspapers and on television and on the internet, Hamas, the Palestinian Hamas, a branch of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, with a sacred covenant that is one of the most anti-Semitic documents of the post-war era, which is replete with references to the protocols of the elders of Zion as an authentic document and the world Jewish conspiracy, and the idea that the Jews were responsible for the First World War, for the Second World War, for every revolution that has happened in modern history, for the chaos, economic chaos, social chaos. They are the warmongers. They are in alliance with the communists and with the Freemasons. Actually, the Hamas has an interesting obsession with Freemasonry, which I haven't really figured out, beyond the fact that they simply copied this from the, you know, the European anti-Semitic tradition. <coughs> and the same thing with regard to Hezbollah, <coughs> Al-Qaeda, and last but not least, and with this I will close with a few uh, quick remarks. Obviously one could talk about this uh, final subject uh, for hours, uh, the example of Iran. Iran is not an Arab country, uh, I assume everybody knows that, and not only is it not an Arab country, but uh, there is an age-old hostility between Persians and Arabs, which needs to be taken into account also in understanding the way the Iranian regime of the Ayatollahs in the last 30 years has used anti-Semitism, as well as uh, militant, radical anti-Zionism. 
as well as the Holocaust denier. I believe one of the main reasons that the Islamic Republic of Iran has chosen this path, and it did not begin with Ahmadinejad, it began with Ayatollah Khomeini, who was an out-and-out, -out radical, and outspoken anti-Semite. And that needs to be understood and undocumented very thoroughly. Long before he came to power, Khomeini, who was a charismatic leader, a great force in the Muslim world, who created something unprecedented in history, the Islamic Republic of Iran, I can think of nothing that really can be compared with it. There was certainly no revolution in the Arab world that you can compare with. This was a major historic event for which we are all now paying the consequences. I mention in parenthesis it happened during the presidency of Jimmy Carter. Uh, whether it, it would have happened... Joe. Uncle Joe. <laughs> Uncle Jimmy. So uh, whether that would have made any difference or not, I leave others to decide. Uh, how many created the institutions of the Islamic Republic of Iraq? And um, he was also a thinker of sorts. And he certainly bought, lock, stock, and barrel, the protocol's view of the world when it comes to Jews and Israel. In the Iranian perception since 1979, obviously we're talking about the elite, very hard to know exactly what goes on in the minds of uh, more educated but repressed strata in Iran, whether they, how, to what extent they buy into this really massive propaganda. I mean, propaganda on a Soviet scale. They probably learned a few lessons there. Um, death to America, death to Israel, that has been the ritual chant for 30 years of all demonstrations, mass demonstrations in Iran. America is the great Satan, and Israel is the little Satan. And sometimes the little Satan even assumes greater importance than the great Satan in the eyes of the Iranian leadership. Ahmadinejad introduced, I think, two elements that were latent previously, but which he has escalated, which is why we're in the position we're in now. One is, that he has taken a strand in the Shia version of Islam, a more messianic, apocalyptic strand, which previously was more quietistic, it was more passive, of waiting for the appearance of the 12th Imam, who will emerge from his hiding and will bring redemption to the whole world, and activated it, made it a lever of policy, a driving force of his own, um, his own uh, positions, very intransigent positions, and even of the nuclearization project. And the second thing which puzzles many people is why this insistence, this truly obsessional insistence on the denial of the Holocaust. Almost every public platform the president of Iran uses in order to make some kind of reference to the myth of the Holocaust, the hoax of the Holocaust, to talk about uh, the need for an independent, objective, impartial examination of the facts, that famous or notorious, scandalous uh, Holocaust deniers conference, I'm sure you all remember from the year 2006, when the Iranian foreign ministry formally invited a motley crew of <coughs> Holocaust deniers from around the world uh, to come to Tehran, where they were hailed and treated as great scholars and uh, uh, major historians, people like uh, uh, Faubisson and David Duke, you know, in the, at the cutting edge of scholarship on, on, on Holocaust. <laughs> and uh, why 
I mean, there are people in Iran, uh, even in the leadership, who probably ask themselves, is this necessary? Is this good for us? They may not think it's immoral or outrageous, but they might think it's counterproductive. Uh, and I think, but it's a hypothesis, and this can be my closing uh, <coughs> remark, I think that Ahmadinejad, repulsive though he is, um, is not the clown that he's often presented as being. Uh, in other words, I think he may well be mad, but there is method. There is method in his madness. Uh, the method is that he knows that Holocaust denial for several decades now has been extremely popular in the Arab world. And as part of the Iranian drive and hegemony, first in the Persian Gulf, then in the wider Middle East and beyond, reaching out to the Arab street, reaching out over the heads of the rulers of Arab states who are treated in the most uh, vitriolic way, so in Iranian propaganda, uh, as treacherous and uh, treacherous lackeys of, of, of the West, reaching out to the masses beyond, you know, the reach of their rule, using Holocaust denial and the kind of extreme forms of anti-Semitism which, which are standard now in, in Iran, goes down well. And combined with anti-Western, anti-American propaganda, it has proved to be quite effective in creating a bridge over the Shia-Sunni divide and beyond the Persian-Arab antagonism. I think this is one of the calculations. It's, I don't think it's the whole explanation. But it is something that we need to take into account because this may be more successful than we assume. Because from a Western standpoint, this, of course, appears incomprehensible. Obviously, nobody in a Western society, however much Western societies now are tinged with elements of anti-Semitism, could pursue that particular line. And it has led to condemnations from the West, although no particular uh, energizing intervention in Iran's drive towards uh, uh, nuclearization. So I think this is a good moment to stop and, uh, and set out on a discussion. Thank you very much for your important seminar and your important, very important work tonight. I don't think those uh, words are like very sincerely, it's very important. And just to pick up on your last point, you spoke about how Amitinajad is using uh, Holocaust and Rap. He's also using uh, the protocols of the other design, which you also mentioned. And I remember when I was at the Geneva Convention uh, last year with the Durban II Conference, Ahmadinejad was the only leader of a country to come to the General Assembly to speak uh, on a global platform. And his narrative, as you know, was based on the protocols of the other design. Mm -hmm. And my feeling, my hypothesis is that this is really beginning to have traction. And that means this may even be more dangerous than the nuclear weapons program that he's pursuing, the regime was pursuing. And that this traction you see in South Africa, the deputy uh, minister, the deputy foreign minister stood up in Soweto and spoke about how Jews were sucking the economy, uh, sucking the, the funds out of the economy in New York, and she received a standing ovation for 20 minutes. Um, there was a young woman in Connecticut who was shot in a cafe by a stalker, a young man, uh, this man killed a young girl who was a waitress in the cafe, and he had the protocols and the other design in his knapsack. Uh, Venezuela. Um, you can see it globally, outside the Middle East, that this is beginning to have traction. What is your view on sort of the resurrection, if you will, and the protocols in popular culture around the world? <coughs> well, I think that <coughs> if we begin with the, with the Arab world, uh, the resurrection of the protocol as something of a bestseller. And there are, I'm told, there are 60 different translations in Arabic of the protocols uh, because there's such a demand for that. Uh, 
that came after 1967 uh, to be far more widespread. It existed before then, it was under the sponsorship of uh, NASA and his power of the nationalist movement, that they had, the Egyptians had actually encouraged the first dissemination on a larger scale of the protocols. Uh, and there were Nazi experts, by the way, working in the Egyptian foreign ministry at that time. Some of them assumed Islamic names and converted to Islam. These were real Nazis, I'm not talking about you know, imaginary ones. And uh, then after 67, uh, this is also an argument I heard once from Bernard Lewis, and I would take it a step further. He thought that in the Arab world there was a desperate need for some kind of reassurance that their crushing defeat, the crushing defeat of three Arab states by Israel, in 1967, in six days, something unheard of, was such a blow to Arab self-esteem, particularly since they've been led to believe uh, for decades that, that the Jews were just a collection of human dust, you know, who had, uh, you know, the scum of the earth who had arrived in Palestine and would, would easily be pushed into the sea. That's what our propaganda was before 1967. And then, to be overwhelmed in this way, there was a need for a theory, for a hypothesis, for an explanation that would salvage what was left of our self-esteem. The protocols were attractive because if you believe them, then you'd have to conclude it was not the tiny state of Israel, with its very small population outnumbered 1 to 30, up to 1 to 60 today, by the Arabs. That had overwhelmed them. But then it was this demoniacal, global conspiracy that the Zionists had infiltrated all the league centers of power in the West, in America, <laughs> elsewhere, and that through 